What's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode 55 of the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything happening in the world of college football. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host. SoundCloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod or Two Stripes Podcast on Apple Podcasts is where you can find and subscribe to the show. You can also check out the show on my YouTube page at YouTube.com slash Colton Denning. If you're a first-time listener, want to welcome you into the show. Hope you guys all like it. Uh, this is going to be a fairly short intro. I tend to make these a little bit longer, but in a little bit of a rush. Got a long weekend ahead of me, so I want to get this show out. And hasn't been a lot going on in college football outside of everything going on at Ohio State right now, which is very not good, and especially as a Buckeye fan been pretty crazy so it'll be interesting to see what happens with Urban Meyer and where Ohio State goes as I record this the university is still in the midst of their investigation of Meyer and the university if you want to hear more of my thoughts about that you can head on over to the Holy Land pod which I do for Land Grant Holy Land on SB Nation you can just search hang out in the Holy Land on Apple Podcasts and SoundCloud there to keep up with our coverage of everything going on with the Urban Meyer investigation. Getting into today's preview though, I've got another returning guest on the show and that would be Billy Gomilla, the managing editor for AndTheValleyShook.com, SB Nation's LSU blog. And we had a very fun discussion about the Tigers and what they look like heading into the 2018 season, how Ed Ogeron has that program, what people think about him in the fan base in Baton Rouge, and what they're going to do this year, because LSU, for the first time in really a long time, seems like they are flying under the radar. Not a lot of people are talking about them, especially when it comes to uh, national discussion or even discussion within their own division in the SEC West. They were picked fifth at SEC Media Days in the West, and that's not something we've seen for a really long time with LSU. So they're not in their usual place, at least in terms of perception, but if there's one thing we know about LSU, it's that they're always one of the most talented teams in the country, especially along the defensive side of the ball. And quarterback play has been that one constant question for them, and with Joe Burrow, the Ohio State transfer, coming in it'll be very fun to watch how that offense progresses and what they look like this season and they're a very young team so it it may be a year where they kind of show some flashes and head into 2019 but as always with LSU it's never going to be dull and I I don't think it'll be dull this season and win or lose and no matter what happens I, I think that LSU is going to be very entertaining tv to watch this season and could be a team that surprises a few which is crazy to say when it comes to them but there's a lot of fun things to learn about lsu this season so let's get right into it here's my discussion with billy gomilla of and the valley shook i am super excited to be joined by a returning guest one of my favorite guests from one of my favorite episodes last season and he is the one of the managing editors for and the valley shook.com lsu's sb nation blog and his name is billy gomilla billy what's up man how you doing thanks for joining the show again hey man not too much just uh getting ready for football season it's just a few weeks out now yeah a lot going on your guys's way and i was checking out the site and you have a new or at least for me it's new looking at it uh and the valley drinks section so what what are you drinking on before the start of the season oh just i'm actually one of my, my favorite local beer places I found out is, is going to, or it's having its lease uh, expire. So I'm going to probably run over there and try and get a growler filled uh, after, I, after I record this. Uh, you know, just try, try to try new things lately. That's been my big deal is just trying, trying as many new beers as I can and, you know, just trying to enjoy the summer. It's been hotter than heck down here. So, you know, anything, anything good and cold and refreshing. So what I, I'm a very, uh, I would say, 
in terms of like an SEC fan base, if I would match that up with my drinking, I am a Kentucky graduate level. If there are people that go to Kentucky and graduate, that is. I am at that level of drinking because I just drink Coors Light and Bush Light. So what should I be drinking coming this fall? Oh, well, if that's what you enjoy, I, I'm a big say, fan of, you know what, drink what you enjoy. I try to avoid the beer snobbery too much. You know, it, it, if you like Coors Light and stuff like that, then then that's what you should drink. I, I usually, <laughs> I'll say this for a tailgate, I usually go with Miller Light. That's kind of what I grew up drinking. My dad drank that, so that was kind of what I transitioned to in high school. And and it was just kind of simpler to just kind of keep it that way. And when when you're when you're tailgating all day and it's hot, you don't want to go with something super heavy or, or something that you can't really stay with. And it's a good kind of session. Just drink all day beer, but it's good to try new things i i think and it, you know it's also good to drink what you like to drink if you don't want to try something fancy don't do that if you want to if it, you know but it, i think it's always good to try and and you know expand your horizons a little bit try new things you might like it hey i, I appreciate you my man for the for the honest answer and you're right i don't want to feel like i'm drinking a sandwich while i'm tailgating that's that's what we got the food for but getting into the episode and what we're here to really talk about and that's lsu football i'm interested to get your takes and 30,000 foot view on everything going on with the Tigers. And before we get into the nitty gritty of this season, what do you think the temperature of, of the LSU fan base is right now coming off a nine and four season? They won six of their last eight games last year, but it, it always seems like they're not un is unrest, but you know, with everything going on with Ed Orgeron and the offense and the constant battle that is, where, where do you think LSU fans are right now with the program? Well, I do think that the recent kind of run of, of poor mouthing and all the you know six seven win fifth place in the West talk has galvanized some folks a little bit, but overall there is some uh, uh, some some unrest. I, I I I think it's just it's a there were, there's a it's just kind of similar to the way there was with Les Miles. There's a group of people who didn't really want Ogeron to get the job. They were never sold on him from the jump, and so therefore his every misstep is their chance to say, I told you so, particularly online. So you see a lot of that, and I think you'll always see that. Those, those people, in my experience, just are never really satisfied, and they just kind of move the goalposts as, as things they say won't happen tend to happen. Personally, I, I think it – LSU set up to have a nice little kind of transition year and moving forward towards hopefully a lot better things in 2019. I think with this schedule and and the youth of this roster, it's still not quite where where they where they where everybody wants it to be or where it needs to be. But I do think it has a chance to get there quickly. You referenced the media picking LSU fifth for in the SEC West at this year's SEC Media Days, which just wrapped up and when you really look at it you know people are obviously always talking about Alabama Auburn won the West last year they have a lot coming back people are really interested in Mississippi State this year and they're you know kind of that trendy hipster pick I think with with what they have going on in Joe Moorhead in his first year there and then even Texas A&M people are pretty hyped up over Jimbo Fisher in his first year in College Station is this the most under the radar you think LSU has been on at least from you know, an overall SEC consensus or even a national media consensus? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is the lowest LSU's been picked in the division since, I think, Jerry DiNardo's last year. Uh, it's probably going to be their lowest preseason poll ranking. I would expect them to be ranked. It may not be, but I would think they would be at least somewhere, probably in a good couple of years, probably since 2010, which LSU was kind of on the people saw LSU's being on the downslope that year. And that's really kind of the parallel that a lot of us have gone to for this team. In 2010, LSU had Patrick Peterson back, but they also had a really good young core coming in of guys like Tyron Matthew, Eric Reed. A lot of the the seeds for that 2011 run were planted in that year, and that group went 11-2. and two. They, you know, they, they nearly, very nearly won the SEC West. They beat Alabama at home. Uh, they, they, they just came up short of getting to the Sugar Bowl, but they went to the Cotton Bowl and they played Texas A&M. And in what would become a precursor, they beat the snot out of them and, and had a, a, a really good close to the year. And that set up a great run in 2011 with another really talented team. And hopefully that's kind of where we're, we're setting up for this year. I do think that the, the addition of Joe Burrow at, at quarterback kind of helps 
move that move that train along a little bit because it does give them a little bit more of a veteran presence at, at quarterback than what they would have had. Yeah, let's talk about Joe Burrow because as an Ohio State fan, I got to see him up close and personal for three years, but he grad transfers to LSU. What are the initial reports on him and how he fits in or changes what they want to do offensively? I don't know that he changes what they want to do. I think he fits it a little bit better than what they had because LSU was coming in with, with two uh, – two Second year players, one one true sophomore and one redshirt freshman. Uh, the true sophomore, Miles Brennan, more of a pocket guy, not necessarily a statue, but kind of skinny, you know, kind of in that, that, that six, six, two, six, three, 195 pound range. A guy they were hoping to maybe have a little more time to, to put some weight on his bones. Quick release, got a, a nice little live arm, kind of. Reminds me a lot of, the, of the, some of the spread quarterbacks you've seen over the years, like a Colt Brennan and Colt McCoy, guys like that, that necessarily weren't big but had nice arms, were accurate. You know, and that's kind of the hope that he could develop into that after being the backup to Danny Etling last year. Then you've got Lowell Narcisse, who, again, you know, both of these guys were, were big recruits. Narcisse, much more of a big physical runner, left-handed, really big arm, but, but a little less accurate, struggled with his accuracy somewhat. In the you know in the spring, coming off a couple of knee surgeries as well in high school that really pushed him down the rankings in in recruiting somewhat. Although he still had lots of offers from big time programs and, and, and was very much a recruit LSU wanted. Both guys I think have a lot of potential down the road, but they're also both guys that LSU was hoping to be able to to you know kind of keep in the oven a little bit longer before playing. And hopefully that's what Joe Burrow will allow will allow to happen comes in and gives you somebody who can start right away. You might even be able to get that red shirt back on Miles Brennan and Lowell Narcisse maybe comes in, gives you some some package snaps as more of a runner just to just to help send some of that pounding on Burrow. Burrow's a big kid and can, you know, we know can run from from what we've seen of him in high school, what we've seen him at Ohio State, but but uh Narcisse much more of a you know big kind of two hundred twenty five, two hundred and thirty pound physical runner who might be a little bit better to, to handle some of the, the snaps. And, and like I said, down the road, we're hopeful, especially with Burrow having two years, that those guys will stick around and then still have, you know, a couple seasons of eligibility left when Burrow is done and that be, be more ready to step in as, as third and fourth year guys. So Burrow has a really, or whoever plays quarterback, we would assume it would be Burrow has a very talented stable of receivers and one guy outside of, the SEC that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about is Jonathan Giles. Texas Tech transfer had to sit out last season, but this is a kid who almost had 1,200 yards receiving and 13 touchdowns in 2016. He's wearing the number seven. If you know anything about LSU, the dudes that wear number seven, they, they are the guys no matter where they're playing. Is he kind of the breakout guy to watch on this team? Because for me watching him at Texas Tech, I was like, okay, th this kid is special. It's not just that he's an air raid receiver. He's a legitimate NFL talent, and it seems like if they have that stability at quarterback, he could be another really great LSU receiver. That's the hope, and it's very rare that you pick up a transfer like him who you know wasn't just productive but was a political finalist and, and fell out of favor at Texas Tech. And, you know, that, that's kind of happened before with, with, with kids on the Cliff Kingsbury and the last one, of the last ones that did it, ended up winning a Heisman Trophy. So I expect to see out of Giles is that steady hand, that guy they can count on to help keep the chains moving on third and six, you know, and, and get open. I, I, I'm not sure he's a game breaker against SEC defenses, which are you know a step better than, than the Big Twelve. But I do think he can be productive, and he's going to allow a lot of the other young talent, especially the freshmen coming in who are who are all big time players, to just have have just have that pressure off of them to, to do the kind of the dirty work to allow them to be the guys who stretch the field while he helps kind of clean things up underneath and keeps the offense moving and that that's certainly my hope for him and I think that's what the coaching staff is hoping for as well one of the things that always seems to be like LSU's trademark in the past couple of years at least was having that go-to running back whether it was Leonard Fournette or Darius Geis but back when I was growing up I always remembered LSU as being that running back by committee, especially under Les Miles, we saw a bunch of different guys get carries, and it seems like that's kind of the way that offense is trending this year, no? Yes, absolutely. For one, there just isn't that kind of a tone on this team, at least compared to a, a wonderful night or a Darius guys. This is definitely much more 
of a committee group. And I'm not really so worried about the running game. I think that, you know, that they have guys that can find yards. You've got Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, who's a little bit different back than what we've seen from LSU, kind of a short, stocky, more of a scat back type, but, but very much a guy who can runs hard and still try to break tackles and still try to push the pile a little bit, five, you know, more like five, eight, kind of two Oh five, kind of in that Maurice shows drew kind of build, you know, we're hopeful that he can at least be, be not necessarily a bell cow, but be a guy they can count on. You've got Nick Brissett, who's a senior who, you know, kind of been inconsistent, injured in and out of the lineup and, Kind of hopeful that maybe his last hurrah can be something like uh, what we saw with Daryl Williams last year as Darius Geis is back up. And then after that, you got some talented freshmen coming in. One I'm really high on is Chris Curry, who was a four-star recruit, although kind of shot up the rankings late in the process. Big weight room guy, big put together, you know, put together guy. Showed a, a, to me a really powerful running style, and I think he may be steps in as your kind of your number two short yardage late back and, and i think it is easy to forget with, with the backs that lsu's had in just the last couple of years that the last time lsu went undefeated it was with a committee of, of three or four backs that they all kind of cycled through and all kind of had their roles so shifting to the defense and we could have just spent the whole episode talking about this dude is i want to give some praise to dave aranda because it seems like he has been everything and more that he was expected to be since coming in. Yeah, absolutely. He came in with with a you know a, a, a big time reputation out of Wisconsin as one of the great coordinators in the country. Somebody that Les Miles wanted very badly, and somebody that Ed Ogeron took to very quickly, and and made made a point to keep around in that first year, and then made it a point to uh, make sure he held, he held on to the second time whether it was both continuing to make sure he, he had a, a very lucrative contract and also making some other coaching moves that Aranda preferred to uh, keep him happy a little bit. He's, he's done a great job here. Really helped transition LSU into a 3-4 after just years of being a 4-3 team. And, you know, at, he's added so much value in a lot of ways. It, one of the things you hear about him a lot is that he's not a recruiter, and a lot of people think that may be why he, he passes on being a head coach. And it's true, he's not that outgoing, beat the bush salesman guy on the road. But one thing he's done with linebackers in LSU is he has really put an emphasis on finding the guys that he likes and finding the guys that fit his system, which is something that LSU had really struggled with under John Chavis, who would kind of look at the guys, the local guys, and be like, "Well, that guy's too small. Well, that guy's too slow. Well, that guy's, you know, not not really what I want." And he, he's an end. He's a safety. Guys like Debo, you know Debo Jones, who's been a great pro, kind of had to be forced on him, and that was part of why he wanted out at the end. Is he? It, he kept seeing. I, I guess the way you could put it, he kept seeing what guys couldn't do. Whereas I think Aranda a lot of times sees what guys can do and then lets them do it. Well, and that's interesting too because Aranda comes from that Wisconsin system that brings you know a bunch of different walk-ons and kind of lives by a completely different philosophy than Chavis where it's like, yeah, let's look at what these guys can do and fit them into that. And not that Wisconsin had subpar athletes, but when you put that with dudes that LSU is recruiting, you, you can see why this defense has been so good. Yeah. Uh, a big thing he talked about from the jump is you know, how excited he was to finally have the, the ability to play a lot of man to man coverage. It was something he didn't really do a lot of at Wisconsin and something that, almost exclusively at LSU they've been able to do because of the cornerbacks and, and defense and safeties they've had, and they can really kind of turn the, turn things loose. And, and it's last year you had the, some ups and downs early, especially when the defensive line was a little banged up, but really closed out the year strong, and, and I'm expecting this unit to be, be Aranda's best, I think, that he's had here. So they're talented everywhere, but what do you think the strength of the defense is? This year I'm expecting it to be just the front seven kind of as a unit because as a 3-4, you've got the, the linebacker, defensive end, hybrid type guys, and so it's hard to kind of differentiate. But up front uh, on defensive line, another Texas Tech transfer, Braden Fajoko, after a sit-out year stepping in, former top 100 recruit. You know, kind of unproductive at Texas Tech, but since he's been here, all he's done is basically win all of the weightlifting awards every every off season, and so we're all kind of excited to see him play. 
and see what he can do. You got Rashard Lawrence who who played last year basically on two two high ankle sprains and was still while he wasn't very productive the difference with him in and out of the lineup was really really striking and I think he's he could be one of those guys that is really really under the radar right now but everybody kind of knows by the end of the year you got the two of them you've got a a group of four real true three four nose tackles you got Ed Alexander big guy same same thing banged up a lot last year defense was much better when he was in the lineup much stiffer he gives you that six two six three 330-pound kind of fire hydrant nose tackle. And then behind him, you've got Tyler Shelvin, who was a huge recruit, had to sit out as a freshman for an academic red shirt. Big, big body, kind of to the point where they're kind of wanting to, to lose some weight and hoping that he can he can make some plays off the bench. And then they had two more nose tackles in the recruiting class. And so LSU's really going to be – back to having a fully stocked defensive line and then out on the edge you've got Caleb on chase on who was recruited and, and sold as being RDT successor and and looks poised to step into that role as kind of a, the sack guy of the defense what's the status of the secondary because everybody knows how good greedy Williams is and, and he's still a sophomore but it seems like that other corner position is a question but just knowing LSU there, there's always somebody there in that secondary that that steps up and becomes a playmaker it seems like yeah and that's kind of what's funny is it really became after you know the the, the big loss of, of uh the number one corner patrick Sertain jr in, in on national signing day to alabama which hurt don't get me wrong lsu had, had basically promised him a starting job and you did not, not you not only lost him you lost him in your own division so you're gonna have to play against him but the hope is that Christian Fulton, another former five-star who was suspended for two years, received a two-year suspension at the end of his freshman year because he attempted to interfere with his NCAA drug test. Essentially, he got caught trying to to slip in somebody else's uh, urine. He uh, backtracked. Sports Illustrated had a great article on this uh, about a month ago. He got caught. He poured it out. He put in his own urine, handed it in, he actually would have passed the test, but because he attempted to circumvent it, they gave him a two-year suspension. That's just ridiculous to do to any college athlete to take away half their eligibility. You know, just go ahead and, and uh, unless it's an ongoing thing, it's one thing if like, well, he he's taking money from boosters and he keeps doing it, or, or you know, he's, he won't give up, he won't stop dealing with this agent or something that's ongoing. But in this case, it was a one-time offense. A two-year suspension to me is kind of ridiculous. And the hope is that um, Fulton will be able to, to kind of get something of a stay and time served. The latest on that from last week was that he will have a chance to kind of sit it with, with a lawyer to kind of meet with the NCAA and go over things. We won't find that out till camp. If he does become eligible, the good news from LSU is he has been practicing the whole time, so he will be ready to step right in and be a starter. If not, they're going to work with either a graduate transfer from Stanford, uh, Ter- uh, Terrence Howard, who, who uh, uh, is expected to come in and help out, just provide some depth. Local kid, been been the third, fourth corner for, for Stanford the last couple of years, missed last year with injury, but he graduated, so he was able to transfer in. If not, watch for uh, Kelvin Joseph, who's a, another big-time recruit, kind of a, a safety corner hybrid nickel-type player, but they may play him out at, say, at corner to – just to make do with some things. And it's funny when people would talk about how the, the secondary is a good question mark. And then you've got Greedy Williams back. You've got Grant Delpit, who was freshman All-American. You've got all these other four-star safety recruits coming back, plus a pair of fifth-year seniors and John Battle and, and Ed Paris. And all I can remember thinking was, okay, y'all say that, but no other coach on this schedule is going to feel bad for us. <laughs> talent in that in that secondary and even if there is something of a, a, a hole at cornerback you can hide one hole so I, I think LSU will still be okay the, the, the days of of LSU just being abjectly terrible in the secondary are long past and I don't think people remember that enough so earlier on you mentioned that there's a part of the fan base that was basically just against hiring Ed Orgeron from the start 
But what do you think that collective feeling is about the job he's doing right now? I think most people are still in kind of wait and see mode. They wanted, they expected more, I think, out of last year's recruiting class. And a lot of it hinged on that certain loss. My take was kind of coming in. It, I didn't have high expectations of that particular class. I knew it wasn't a, a super well-regarded class within the state of Louisiana. And LSU's recruiting is always going to be more Louisiana based. And if Louisiana doesn't have a great group of, of guys coming out, that kind of lowers your ceiling a little bit, even though you do go to Texas and you do go to Florida and you do, you know, you, you do sprinkle in the out of state kids where you can. The big thing this is, is going to be this year. And, and it's going to be telling both on the field and off in terms of how she does and how they close out the 2019 class, which is going to be much more highly regarded multiple four and five star kids in the state and a lot of kids that Ogeron and, and staff really need to close on. They've, they've had a couple of high profile misses at key spots in his first two years, even though they have done a great job of shoring up LSU's main weakness, which at the end of the last miles era was on the line of scrimmage. They've, they've really loaded up on interior linemen and that's something that's needed. But this year it's going to be more about those glamour positions, finding a quarterback, finding some, some top shelf running backs, you know, a couple of, an, another cornerback to replace uh, Pete, the you know, loss of uh, certain, but you do have a lot of those guys here. They've got, uh, you know, four star Tyrion Davis right here in Baton Rouge committed. They've got a five star guard in Cardell Thomas committed five star cornerback who I think he's number one, the number one player in rivals rankings. And I think he's number five on two, four, seven. And Derek Stingley Jr., he'll be coming in at cornerback. And there's still a couple guys out there. They've got a quarterback committed in Peter Parrish out of Alabama. They've got uh, Ishmael Sopser, who's a big-time defensive tackle, still on the board that that they're, they're going to battle Alabama for from from uh, an area of Mississippi that not Mississippi out of Louisiana that LSU struggled with lately. A couple guys left, but it, right now. Things seem to be on the up uptick. We'll see how that how that continues. And, you know, it's recruiting. It can always change between now and signing day. Well, and I'm sure the takes will be measured no matter how that week one game of LSU and Miami goes. There's like three or four games on that week one slate where the losing fan base is going to make their head coach here. And that's one of them. But that's to a larger thing where just looking at this schedule, it is a doozy. And it's going to be, I think, very challenging and you look at the game against Miami and Arlington to kick it off at Auburn two weeks later, and then a stretch from October 6th to November 3rd of at Florida, home against Georgia, home against Mississippi State, a bye week, and then home against Alabama. If this is a prove year for this team, I think that this is a really good schedule to, like you said, build into something even more in 2019. That's the hope. You know, Miami, I think, is maybe a little bit better of a matchup than you think of at first blush. Coming off the season the Hurricanes had last year, they are rebuilding on both lot, their lines of scrimmage, and they're a little iffy at quarterback. Malik Rozier, you know, he had his highs, but he he kind of closed the, out the season on a really, really bad streak of game. So LSU's hoping to maybe catch them early. Auburn, really tough place to go play. LSU's only won there three times in the last 20 years, and all three wins came over coaches that were in the last year of their of their. Uh, their contracts and that were on on their way to being fired, whether that was uh, go all the way back to, to Terry Bowden or Gene Chizik, uh, Tommy Tuberville, you know, the, that those were the, the, the Auburn teams that LSU was able to beat. So that one's going to be tough. And even some of your other non-conference games, you've got teams like Louisiana Tech who, you know, they're in bowls. I kind of called it last year with Troy. I told people going to that game, like, look, Troy's going to come in here and they're going to come here and try to, do everything they can to win this game. And they're not that much worse than a lot of the other teams were going to play. They probably were in fact, better than a number of, of SEC teams at LSU beat. Louisiana tech is kind of a similar situation that they're, they're coming off a bowl win. They're going to come in here with their heads on fire. And, and I, I do think LSU is going to be going to be in a good situation and be able to beat them, but they're going to have to work for it. They're not going to be able to just roll their helmets out there and, and win by 50 points. So we'll see. And then, of course, you do draw Georgia from the East. So you go into this season knowing that you're going to be playing at least two teams that on paper are better than you, and that's Alabama and, and Georgia. So you have to just kind of go into that with that mindset of one week at a time, and we'll see how they do from there. And, of course, 
Mississippi State's got a lot returning and a new, new head coach, but he should be well set up to succeed there. Yeah, it's wild when you go into the season with your schedule being, or on that schedule, being the two participants in the SEC title game and the national champion who is also in your conference. That, that's a hell of a schedule. But like just touching on the LSU-Miami thing again, that uh, that was a good point about Malik Rozier and, and Miami's offense. And when you give Dave Aranda like nine months to prepare for those weaknesses, I don't know if I want to be Miami going into that. But final question here. What do you think a fair expectation is for LSU this year? I think anywhere between eight and ten wins is very, very possible for this team. You know, LSU went nine and four last year and six and two in the SEC. And if they'd have had a good kicker, they'd have gone eleven and two because they'd have won the Troy game and they would have won the the uh, bowl game against Notre Dame. Both both featured very, very makeable missed kicks. Not not forty plus yarders, but you know, I- inside a forty yard kicks that that a good kicker will make. And the hope hope is that graduate transfer Cole Tracy will provide that this year. So it's just going to come down to a couple of breaks and a couple of, of, of bounces and we'll see. And I don't have championship expectations. I think everybody in, in the division still really playing catch up to Alabama, including Auburn. I know Auburn beat them last year and won the West, but who won the national championship? That's the thing. It, it's beating Alabama is not a one game, one day thing. You have to, Keep building your program up, and I, I hope that that's what LSU is doing. I think they're on the right track of doing that. So beyond beating them this year, I think they're heading in the right direction. And the hope is that they put together a nice, you know, nine, ten win season, and then even with a couple of early NFL defections, there's still going to be a lot coming back to set up a run for tw- for 2019 to, to be back to being a championship contender with with a senior Joe Burrow, a bunch of starters back on your offensive line, a bunch of bunch of veteran guys stepping in on defense. Well, I know personally I have a very vested interest in them this year to see how Joe Burrow does. Excited to uh, see him have some success down in Baton Rouge and hopefully they can make some noise. And if you want to keep up with anything LSU related, please visit and the Valley Shook com for any of your football needs food needs and as we said earlier any drink needs they got some of the best coverage on the college football internet be sure to follow them on twitter at valley shook and you can follow billy on twitter at atvs underscore chef billy billy this was even better than the first one thank you for joining the show and uh thank you for breaking down lsu football no problem man happy to do it Shout out to Billy for joining the show and dropping knowledge on LSU football and giving me some beer advice. Like I said, I'm just, I'm white trash, man. Bush Light and Coors Light, that's all I do. Maybe a Corona. I did some of that last weekend. I enjoy that. But um, if it's not white trash beer, I'm not interested. But maybe I will expand my horizons this fall and, and get into some different beer. But thanks to Billy for the suggestions and for joining the show and talking about LSU football. If you want to continue to keep up with LSU football, head on over to andthevalleyshook.com. Follow Billy on Twitter at ATVS underscore Chef Billy. And follow the site's account at Valley Shook. Before I get out of here, I want to thank you, the listener, for tuning into today's show. I hope you enjoyed it, especially if it was your first time. And I hope you come back and listen to all the other episodes that I record this season of the Two Stripes podcast. The two easiest ways to keep up with the show and the best ways to keep up with the show are by first subscribing on Apple Podcasts. You can just search Two Stripes Podcast there, find the show, rate, review. Please leave me some feedback about what I can do to make the show better. You can also find it on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod. And you can find the show and all my other college football video work on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash Colton Denning. You find the show, some college football highlights, Ohio State highlights. I'm hoping to cut up some games this season. So there'll be a lot of stuff on the YouTube page. That's youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Make sure to check out that as well. I hope everybody has an enjoyable and relaxing weekend. I'm headed up to Sonoma 
for a wedding and I will not be drinking any wine, you can rest assured that I am going to find a way to sneak some Bush Light and Coors Light up to that wedding and declass it a little bit. So I hope whatever you're doing, you have some higher standards and morals this weekend than I do. Hopefully be back with another show next week kind of wrapping up the preview series since the season is so close right now maybe talk some big picture stuff playoff talk teams we can see in the last four i have a guest in mind that i think you will really enjoy and will be a very entertaining and off the rails discussion so stay tuned for that and until next time my name is colton denning and this is the two stripes podcast